Welcome to Book Me Podcast, sponsored by Nimbus Publishing. I'm Lindsay Glode Rainingbird. Join me as we journey through contemporary Canadian literature, reading as much as we can and chatting with authors, illustrators, and other bookish folk, celebrating our dynamic, diverse, and vibrant national literary scene as we go. So grab a snack, get cozy, break that binding, dog ear those pages, let's dig into it. Today, it is my great honor to welcome Senator Don Oliver. He's the first black man appointed to the Senate, a lawyer and lifelong social and civil rights activist, and he's used his illustrious career to fight anti-black systemic racism and promote diversity at all levels here in Canada and around the world. In his much-anticipated memoir, A Matter of Equality, he takes us through his fascinating life, impressive family, and the choices and experiences that have made him who he is. An inspiration to us all. So welcome to the podcast, Don. Oh, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. Oh, we're excited to have you here. So your book covers so much ground, and I want to get to that. But first, I want to know what it was like to revisit and reflect on an entire lifetime's work. Uh, It was it was exciting, but very difficult because, uh, you know, I've been lucky that I haven't had just one job in life, but I've been in many different fields and uh, I had to pick and choose what things from each of those fields would go in the book. So then I said, look, I really want a theme. And I think that my theme is that I would like to find ways to have a a more tolerant Canada, to have all Canadians respected, irrespective of their race, their color, and the normal things that you read in the Human Rights Act. So I then said, I'm going to write a book, and the central theme of the book will be tolerance. And what does it really mean, and how does it break down, and what are the various aspects Absolutely. Yeah. And you mentioned just now about all the jobs that you had and you had to tear down to each one. Just to give a little sense of that, when I was doing my notes, I had to, for myself, just list everything you'd done. I was like, oh my gosh. So construction, news reporter, news editor, cookbook author, lawyer, senator, farmer, farmer, Christmas tree (laughs) exporter. It's an amazing amount of different things that you've done in your life. All of which brought their own special interests, joys, some some, some heartaches, but uh, you learn from every, every heartache. So you grew up in Wolfville, the only black family, mm-hmm. where it seemed you felt embraced as a family, especially by Acadia University. We've had a long tradition at Acadia, way over 100 years, where my grandfather on both sides played a major role in various aspects of Acadia. My father did, and then all of his children went to Acadia and uh, got an education. And on my mother's side and on my father's side, uh, they went to Acadia. And uh, my grandfather on my father's side was a janitor and worked at Acadia and was very, very well respected by presidents and students alike. And there was one president who once wrote that uh, when I get, after I've had a trip and when I get back in town, after I talk with the accountant of the university, I go to William Oliver and ask him what's been going on on campus. What should I know? He knew everything. Yeah. Yeah, So your father was inducted as a lifetime member of the class of 51. That's correct. Yeah. Which is so amazing. And something that struck me was that they would do that for him and care about him so much. But at the same time, this is the same community that when your family wanted to build a house in the heart of town that was threatened to be burned down. That's right. So to me, I felt that was such scary tightrope to be walking on growing up in a community like that. I don't know what it was like for you and your family. There were five children in the family of Clifford and Helena Oliver, and we all learned in our own different ways at a very early age, that our color was something that was never going to go away, and that in order for us to succeed, we had to transcend color and get beyond it and start dealing with life at that level. And so uh, once we made that determination, a lot of things like threats to burn you down and so on could be pushed aside, and you could move on and say, I'm going to continue to work hard, do good works, and good works will pay off. My father and my family have been quite uh, religious, and my father was a devout Christian, and my mother was mother, my mother's father was a very famous Baptist preacher, Reverend Dr. William White, 
And so we had a lot of uh, Baptist theology piped into us. And, and that's another thing my father learned to turn the other cheek when things like, we're going to burn down your home if, if you build here. He sold the lot and bought some other land somewhere else. It's a really dignified way to handle something like that. But I guess what else could you do? Yeah. Your parents didn't have the opportunity to go to university, but all their children were phenomenal students. So how did they instill that importance of education in you all? I think that the DNA of the Oliver family on my father's side and the White family on my mother's side, the DNA is education. Get education and improve yourself. You always have to be learning because that will help you to contribute back if you fully understand what back is and what is it that I want to give back to and f for what reasons. So that, that DNA meant that in my mother's side, my grandfather was born nine years after slavery was abolished in the United States. His mother and father were slaves on a tobacco plantation in Virginia. And uh, he was sent to uh, school because there were schools available after slavery was abolished. And he ended up in Washington. And in Washington, he was a pretty bright young student. And there was a missionary from Acadia University in Wolfville teaching there. And she really took a liking to him. And she said, you know, you should come to our Katy University. And he stopped and looked at her and he said, would they take a black person like me at your university? She said, I don't know, but let me check. So she wrote the university to see if there were any bylaws against black people. And uh, there weren't because a black person had graduated already in uh, 1894. So she suggests, so he came. And uh, so that's the education component on my mother's side. And on my father's side, uh, he had a son, uh, Reverend Dr. William. Oliver, who got uh, his degrees at Acadia, and uh, his, his children went to Acadia. And uh, so it's just part of the DNA. I'd say, yeah. And just Acadia University making such a huge change to maybe the trajectory of your history, really. I'll tell you how it culminated. A friend of mine, Ron Joyce, who started the Tim Hortons franchise, wanted to do something for me for the work I'd done in the Senate and so on. I said, I don't want it for me. I want it for my parents. And so he endowed a um, $5,000 a year bursary for blacks in Nova Scotia to go to university. And it's, uh, it's indexed, and it's in the name of Clifford and Helena Oliver, my parents. So, I mean, I, I couldn't be happier. A beautiful tribute. Yeah. And that's something that when you first started thinking about how you can give back to your community and help the youth, that was one of the things that you wanted to do, right? Like help them get educated, know the importance of education, and thus have more employment opportunities and things like that. Exactly. So beautiful, full circle. Yeah. 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 You come from a very well-known, highly achieving family. Your aunt, Portia White, half-brother, Dr. W.P. Oliver, and his wife, Perlene, among others, all worked tirelessly for Black Nova Scotians. In a time of such hardship, segregation, and overt racism, what do you think drove that success? Well, part of it's the DNA. And then part of it is that they, they, they had exceptional talents. Like Portia was the first Canadian in Canadian history to receive international acclaim as an opera singer, you know, as, as a contralto, the first Canadian. And so this was, this was just an, an art that she had, that she was endowed with, that wouldn't go away. And as the more people heard her sing, the more they realized, my goodness, there's greatness here. We've got to promote it. And uh, her father, Reverend Dr. White, was a very famous Canadian preacher, and he preached not only at the Cornwallis Street Baptist Church, as it then was in Halifax, but he did a radio show that went all across Canada wow. and into the western states, like Oregon and so on. And uh, people there heard, heard Portia as a young girl, you know, eight, nine, and ten singing. They said, listen to that voice. And so they, they wanted to pursue and learn more about Portia, and so she uh, ultimately did her debut at the town hall in New York. So you can imagine a little black woman going down to New York with all of the pressures and people from around the world wanting to get into the town hall. And she got in, made it, and she got rave reviews for her uh, opening concerts. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and she had to fight racism all the way. And she fought racism even in Nova Scotia. She uh, came and visited my mother, and my mother played the piano. She was an accomplished pianist, and Portia sang for some of the dignitaries from Acadia who my parents had invited, like the Dean of Theology and the President of the University, to hear Portia sing. And I remember that uh, later she had been invited up to New Glasgow 
to uh, sing at a small church there. And she put on a wonderful concert, sang in five different languages, and had that big, big, round, contralto voice filling the church. And when it was over, she was exhausted because she was kind of at the end of the tour. So she went to the largest hotel in New Glasgow, the Norfolk Hotel, and said, I'd like a room for the night. And they looked at her and they said, I'm sorry, we don't take black people like you in this hotel. And so fortunately, one of the women from the Baptist church who'd been in the concert said, look, we have an extra bedroom come. We'll put you up for the night. So she did that. She had a good night's sleep and moved on. So that's Nova Scotia, you know, in 1950s. You can sing for us, but yeah. you can't stay at our hotel. That's right. Pretty sad, eh? It is sad. Yeah. Portia left her mark, and she, she broke down so many barriers, not just in music, but in other ways, that, you know, if you're good and you persevere and you work at it, uh, then uh, you, you know, you're, you're going to succeed. You're also very musical as well. You played the trumpet. Yeah. I missed that on your list of jobs. <laughs> I was like, oh, yes, jazz musician. <laughs> But I don't think I've ever heard of a family that's had that many stars in it. Do you think it was your family that gave you that push to be as great as you are? Oh, I, I don't think there's any question about that. Your, your mother and fa father mold who you are. My, my mother and father were both extremely hard workers. Both of them would always have not more than one job that they were holding down to make money because we were just a poor black family in a white town. We were the only black family in town. And so we had enough land that we could grow vegetables and sell them and make a little bit of money and have vegetables f for ourselves. We had pigs, so we had our own pork, and we had chickens, got our own eggs and hens, and had a cow at one stage for our own milk and butter. So we were pretty well self self-sufficient. And I know that when the Second World War was on, and they started rationing things, they said you can only have so much butter, you can only have so much sugar, and so on. It wasn't diff difficult for us because we were producing so much of our own. But that that was all good fun because, you know, we would go out and pick blueberries and, and my mother would make beautiful blueberry muffins and blueberry pies and so on. And, and, and blackberries, we picked them. We raised our own strawberries and we kids would sell them on the road uh, to people passing. And is that where your love of cooking came from? They really came from my sisters. If it were today, my sisters would be going to something like med school or dental school or one of the professions. But in those days, if you were a woman, you know, well, what do you do? You're going to have kids, so you better you better take something where there's going to be kids. So home economics, you got to learn how to cook and learn about d different fabrics to make clothing for your kids and so on. So both my sisters were streamed into home economics. And home economics did include cooking. So my sisters would come home. My mother would say, well, what did you do in school today? Well, today in class, we learned about fatty acids and amino acids. And uh, then I'd be all ears and listening. <laughs> and, and one of my sisters said, this is girl talk, Donny. So, so I said, well, you know, I want to learn about it. And then they would cook some of the dishes that they had learned in school. And we'd be eating them for our own dinner. And my, my parents were saying, yum, yum, this is so good. And I said, look, I, I got to learn how to do this. And so I started buying cookbooks and reading them and uh, anything I could get my hands on. And then later on, I had a private tutor. And then after that, I took cooking classes in Halifax. And then after that, I wanted to get better. So I went to London to the Cordon Bleu and I took the most advanced course there at the Cordon Bleu. And uh, then I went from there to uh, a year or so later to Italy and took uh, lessons from a, a chef there on Italian cuisine. And uh, then I uh, wrote a book that was a lot of fun. And uh, <laughs> then I um, used food and cooking as a way of giving back to society because uh, I, you know, I became fairly good at it. And a number, number of people, groups, and organizations would say, if you would put on a dinner uh, and raise some money, uh, would you give that money to us to help our fundraising? And I said, yes. So, you know, the Neptune Theater in Halifax put on an auction, and I put on a dinner, I think, for 10 people bid um, $1,000 a plate for my food. So it was $10,000 wow. $10, they made. And I did them for Alzheimer's and autism and many other groups to, uh, to, raise, to raise money for charity. Is there an alternative reality where you could have been happy just as a chef? I love food and cooking, and uh, I still read an awful, every day I'm reading uh, recipes, cooking techniques, and so on. It's just, a, it's just a hobby, and it's just something I just love. Lifelong passion. Yeah. And at what point were your sisters, okay, yes, Donnie, you can cook too? 
That's why I named the book that, with my tongue in my cheek at my sister's show. You're talking about your Men Can Cook Too uh, cookbook that Don Oliver wrote in 1981. Yeah, cooking was, was fun, and it was something that I could do that had a, a social and political purpose. And also, it gave me fun. If I had a hard day, say, in court as a lawyer, I had a, a busy, busy day in the Senate with speeches and meeting people and so on, I could go home, loosen my tie, take off my vest and go to the kitchen. And it was another world, you know, just uh, creating and having fun. My husband is the same way. He does all the cooking in our ah, house. Yep. Yep. I like that. I'm sure your wife, <laughs> Linda, likes that too. <laughs> you championed a lot of causes during your time in the Senate. Anti-stocking bills, anti-spam, democratic and parliament transparency, Black History Month among them. But one of your highest priorities, I think, from reading your book might be business case for diversity. So for people who don't know what that is, do you want to explain a little bit and then maybe tell the story of how you proved it? Okay. Look, just assume two sheep were born. One was white and one was black. They are both still sheep and they're nice sheep. The only difference is the color of the fur. And so apply that to humans. In order to have an accepting, tolerant society, we have to learn to accept difference. All differences, sexual differences, differences in the way we eat, differences in the way we wear our hair, differences in whether we have a beard, differences in the way we walk, differences in the languages we speak. All of these are superficial differences because when you want to get down to the meat of doing the job that you're assembled to do, being born in different countries, different cultures, speaking different languages, that adds to the bottom line in making a, a better business case. So the business case for diversity is bring in people of different colors and different languages, put them in a room, give them a job, hire them, compare that to what they call the 10 white men in black suits who all went to the same university and college, played football together, and when they're given a problem to solve, they easily come up with the answer that they all agree with. In the diverse group, they're going to come up with something creative, new, and, and modern, and it's going to move their company, their university, their institution, whatever it is, to the top of the pack because people could accept differences for what they were and moved on and created a beautiful product. Yeah, embrace them yeah. even for mm -hmm. the innovation. Yeah. The story that I love in your book is when you're going to the bank and you're walking through. Do you want to tell it? I was having lunch with the senior manager of one of the largest companies in Canada. And uh, it was on top floor of one of these high-rise buildings. I was escorted, met, met at the door at the bottom and escorted up to the office. Walked through the top floor to the corner office where the president lived. And I looked around. I got to the president's office. I said, look, I great view from here and it's wonderful. I said, when I walked through, I noticed that there were no women and there were no black people. And uh, that, that kind of surprised me. He says, oh, look, that, that happens. A little time passed and he said, our policy is, and it always has been, that we only hire the best. If they were the best and they were good, they would be there and they're not there. So if you're suggesting we discriminate, what's your proof? You're a lawyer, what's your proof? And I said to myself, I have no proof. And I, I was caught. And so I left the meeting. You know, the, we had our meeting and talked about what we wanted to talk about and uh, shook hands and I left. And I started thinking and thinking and thinking, what can I do? Where am I going to get proof? There were no studies, academic studies done anywhere in Canada on this kind of problem. What is, what is the proof that there is any black systemic racism in Canada? How do you prove that? What's yeah. the proof that there's a, a glass ceiling for women? You know, why can't women break through that glass ceiling? So, and I said, there's no proof for any of you. Went through many different lobby and, and groups that could do uh, such a study. And finally, I ended up with the Conference Board of Canada. And I went to see the president said, look, I need to have a study done on barriers to uh, minorities in both the public and the, pub and the private sector and why they can't get farther ahead and closer to the top. We had negotiations back and forth for weeks. And finally, they said, we're going to do your study. It's going to cost you $500,000. And uh, so I went out, I raised the $500,000. And at that time, I guess it wasn't as easy as it sounds, but I went to a banking friend of mine and said, I'm doing this study and I really need to get a good start. Can you help? So they gave me a check for 50000 And then I went to the head of the Treasury Board, who was a friend of mine, who was also very keen on diversity and the business case for diversity. And he said, well, I'm going to give you 50000 So there I had 100000 base to start. So then I went out to BCE and uh, 
Power Corporation and many other companies. And I raised the money uh, and, and gave her the 500000 but said that I wanted to have an oversight committee over their researchers, and they'd have to report to us every two weeks. After about uh, four weeks of reports, nowhere in the reports did they use the word racism. They would talk about visible minorities being held back for systemic reasons, but nowhere did they ever use the word racism. So, you know, we had to, we, our committee said, well, is there racism? And uh, are people being held back because of the color of their skin? And finally, they got the word in and we got it, but it was a uh, it was difficult. Well, yeah, for another person, they might have stopped when you have to pay the 500000 for the study. You just kept going and you got it done. And hmm. that's super inspiring. You detailed so many friendships and mentorships in your book with highly respected and powerful people. Great reading, all of them. But for me, I love the story of you meeting Barack Obama, who also a personal hero of mine. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that was like? The Prime Minister at the time was Prime Minister Stephen Harper, who was awfully nice and awfully good and kind to me in a number of ways. And he uh, knew that I'd done work in the black community, trying to make things better, trying to get more blacks to stay in school and to go to school and help provide some of the financing for that. And so uh, Harper said that he talked to Obama and said, look, I'd like to meet one of our senators uh, who's black, who's done a lot of work. And uh, I thought the two of you should meet someone to bring him down. And he said, look, I'd love to meet him. So the next trip was a pre-briefing on a G20 meeting. And so President Obama and Prime Minister Harper had to meet to be briefed on the various topics. I was invited, went to the White House, and went into the Oval Office. So the meeting was held, and I heard it all and listened to it all and watched it all. At the beginning, as people came in, support team for Obama was Hillary Clinton. And I'd met Hillary before. So I said, look, we met in Halifax when you got your honorary degree from the Mount. It's great to see you again. And then we talked about education and so on. And so we had a great, great conversation. She and uh, Obama, even though they ran against each other, were quite a strong team. After it was all over and after the media came and took their pictures, uh, I heard a voice say, Senator, it was Obama calling me over. He said some very kind things based upon the things that Harper had said about me and my work. And I, st I was quite flustered and quite embarrassed <laughs> with all those words that were so nice from the president, who I deeply admired. And I said that uh, I admired him for what he had done. And then I said, you know, sir, not far from here, just down in Virginia, my great grandfather and his wife and family were all slaves on a plantation. Then uh, my grandfather left there, got an education, came to Acadia and to Canada and uh, made a great contribution. So here I am, his grandson, being able to meet the President of the United States, this enslaved family. If they could only see this, it would mean so much. He said, well, look, let's have a picture taken with the President of the United States with the first black senator in Canada. So with that, he called over the photographer. The two of us shook hands and we had the picture taken. Then he said to me, how would you like to have your picture taken standing between the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Canada and then I was really blushing. I said, I'd love it. So they took that picture too. But he was just so, so gentle, so kind, so warm, just an, an awfully nice man. And he was a great president. I also like the part where in the story you tell in your book where you accidentally put your, your bag on like a centuries old desk I and you're just like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So you've made such admirable social change working with the, within the system throughout your life, but the struggle never stops. So what are your hopes for Canada's future? The pandemic's over now. You can meet people again now, and you can do things again. And I'm just hoping that Canadians will not forget the importance of accepting difference. Because when you look at Canada today, one of our biggest problems, we don't have enough workers to operate our restaurants, our businesses. I can't think of a business that doesn't need employees. Like in the Christmas tree business, we can't get enough employees to do the work that has to be done between now and, and uh, December. And uh, in the past, they've been bringing in Mexicans. So to bring in people from Mexico all the way up to Nova Scotia is expensive. The farmer has to pay for that. The farmer has to pay for the housing. And so if we had a more forgiving Canada and it were easier for immigrants to come into Canada and to get jobs here and to work here in our hotels and all of the areas where our own people don't want to work anymore. People from Asia, from Africa, and from the West Indies and South America, uh, they would love to have an opportunity to work in Canada because Canada's still got one of the best and strongest democracies in the world. It's a wonderful place to live. I agree, yeah. You know? And what do you hope your legacy will be? It's a very difficult question, but I just hope that... Uh, people could realize that in order to get over the concept 
and the doctrine of white privilege. They have to be forgiving, and they have to be prepared to work with white people to help them understand the soul of the black person. I'm fifth generation Canadian, but in that soul, even with a fifth generation, I still have the vestiges of the feelings of slavery in my psyche. It's just there. I was made to be inferior. I was told I was stupid, didn't have an education. I was lazy. Well, you know, you have to overcome those stereotypes. So in order to overcome them, and once you overcome them, yeah, we're going to have a much better, better country. And I feel that they can be overcome. Uh, with good faith. And, uh, you know, I've met a number of people of all colors of good faith who've come to me. I want to help. Yesterday, for example, I was at a place where a person came up and said, look, I've been reading a bit re recently about black history, and I want to do something, and I want to find a way that I can help with my talent. So, you know, I was pretty happy about that. Yeah. Now is the time, if you haven't already. <laughs> yeah. 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 After 25 years as a lawyer and 23 years in the Senate, just when you think you can finally slow down and enjoy retirement, you're diagnosed with a fatal genetic condition, and then you get on a clinical trial that seems to be working, and it gets canceled. I didn't know that that was even something that could happen, but it sounds completely devastating. How do you overcome something like that, or how do you even come to terms with it? It was very close to devastating, and it was very scary. I was in an MRI, and uh, as soon as I got out, uh, the technician said, there's a doctor over there waiting to see you. Do you know a Dr. Grogan? I said, yes. She's my cardiologist here at the Mayo Clinic. He says, well, she, she desperately needs to see us right over there. So I went over, and she said, this is your last treatment. The uh, pharmaceutical company is canceling the uh, clinical trial because they have found that people are dying from it. And this was a global trial. I mean, people from Japan and all over Europe and South America were on the same drug that I was, and uh, some of them were dying. And so the board of directors and the others met and said, look, we've got to stop it. We've got to stop it today. There will be no more. But it was helping you. It was helping me. And my wow. wife and I felt it was, really was. So I wrote the president of the company and said, look, I know you know, we have withdrawn it, but don't, don't throw it out because uh, a lot of it works. And what we found out ultimately was that the doses they were giving us was too strong. And the other thing is they, uh, they found on further analysis that a number of the people who were dying were dying from old age and from other, uh, other diseases. So it wasn't just the drug. I, I was lucky enough to get on another one that I'm still on. And so every 21 days now, a nurse comes to my home and infuses me for, for three and a half hours with, the, with this new drug that seems to be keeping me alive. Yeah, because they originally only gave you six months that's to right, live. That's right. But you're still here. <laughs> yes. Not going anywhere. No, and enjoying life too. So you have an excerpt for us. Yeah, there's an excerpt from the book that you've been talking about today, A Matter of Equality, The Life's Work of Senator Don Oliver. And there's a foreword by the Right Honorable Brian Mulroney and George Eliot Clark, Canadian poet, and my cousin. In 1968, I worked with Gus Wedderburn, who was then head of the Nova Scotia Association for the Advancement of Colored People. I was vice president. We became aware of a tragedy in which a three-year-old girl had died and her local cemetery in St. Croix, Hans County, would not bury her because she was black. The white residents of St. Croix had passed a bylaw in 1907 that barred the burial of black people in that cemetery, even children. It was utterly astounding. We went public with our concerns. St. Croix rescinded that law a few weeks after our outcry, and the child was laid to rest. The St. Croix law was shocking to many people, but for much of Nova Scotia's history, it was not permissible to bury black people alongside, quote, the general population, unquote, which means white people. Instead, black people had to bury the family and friends in the spaces along the outer edges of graveyards. It was part of the province's widespread segregation. Some of it was formally enshrined in laws, and some of it was in the hearts and minds of individual people. Many white barbers, for example, would not cut a black man's hair. I personally experienced that in North End Halifax when I approached a shop with four empty chairs, and one of the gray-haired barbers came to the door and waved me on. We don't cut your kind of hair here, he told me. 
Churches and schools were still segregated. Black churches, black schools, white churches, white schools, long after segregation was declared illegal in 1954. Orphanages were segregated by race. Our military was rigorously segregated. Athletic and sports facilities used by the public were closed to blacks on strictly racial grounds. In public schools, black students were stereotyped by white teachers as predatory, objectionable, and without educational value. Young black women could still not get to the Victoria General Hospital's nursing school to complete the requirement for the registered nurse's designation merely because of the color of their skin. Halifax wouldn't send snow plows and road graders to Africville, a black community, but was still collecting the residents' taxes, and later it would be sending bulldozers to destroy the community. Life was hard. There was little room in many black lives for hope. It was hard to dream a happy dream. Many of our people had hit bottom and were trying to bounce back. One wondered, what would it take for things to get better? We lived in anticipation. Various levels of government, many social and charitable organizations, many clergymen, and countless others took steps to stop the bleeding in the black community and to try to find solutions. My sister Shirley and Jeannie both married men from Bermuda, which led me to visit the country in the late 1950s and early 1960s. I expected cultural shock. Instead, fell head over heels in love with the tiny enchanting island. The former English colony was decorated with beautiful pastel homes along the shoreline. It feels wonderful to splash in the warm, foamy waves on a pink, sandy beach. It was a bit of paradise for me. The last thing I expected to find there was black power. That was truly a cultural shock. In Bermuda, I found that black people were united. They knew their culture and heritage and led and ran their own organizations to build community. As I walked along the sunny streets of Hamilton, the capital, I was shocked and pleasantly surprised when I saw, for the first time in my life, black economic power, black financial power, black cultural power. I had never experienced this in Canada. In Wolfville, we were the only black family. Here it seemed like everyone was black. Black people started businesses. Black people owned the stores and shopped in the stores. Black people chauffeured rich white people around and some of the rich people were black. Most of the government was black. The head of the bank was black. Many surgeons were black. Black people were the majority in Bermuda, and you could see the impact everywhere. It was so different from home in Nova Scotia, when at a time we still had segregated schools, churches, and businesses. Bermuda showed me that black people can do anything. I was stunned in awe of this exercise of black power. It filled me with a secret glee and delight. Yet Bermuda was still poisoned by racism everywhere you turned. White people were a minority, but they still controlled the majority of the wealth and the power. Some families had built their wealth as slave owners. Some white people still thought of black people as slaves. And with white privilege, they defined black people as lazy, apathetic, dumb, and shiftless good timers despite abundant evidence to the contrary. I returned to Nova Scotia eager to apply the Bermuda lessons of viable economic power to our scattered black communities. We too could do anything. It brought me hope. That really was profound and really struck me when I read that in your book. That was one of the places that you found the idealism of what Canada could be. That's, that's what I hoped that it would be. Do you think it's made at least strides? Very, very slowly. Look, we got a few black restaurants, a few black clothing stores and so on, but uh, black power means black power, financial power. You got to get into uh, the banks and the financial institutions and the lending agencies and, and uh, areas uh, where, where there's a, a good turnaround of cash flow and where profits can be made. So owning certain businesses that are on the up and coming, that's what black people have to own. And so far, there, there are exceptions. I mean, there are black billionaires who've made it in, uh, in all these areas I've just talked about, but not enough, not enough black billionaires. So that's one of your big hopes then, mm-hmm. more black business owners. Yeah. That's the way forward. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, it's been my pleasure. 
A Matter of Equality, The Life's Work of Senator Don Oliver is available at bookstores everywhere. And thank you for listening and hanging out with us. Join me next time on this book lover's journey as we try to read more, read Canadian, read local. You know, all the good things. <laughs>